Hi, and welcome to today's lesson. We're going to be looking at changing cities. In this lesson, we're going to be looking at urbanization, suburbanization, greenfield and brownfield sites, push and pull factors, impact of population increases, developing, emerging and developed countries, rapid urbanization and its effects, sustainable cities, climate change, and site situation, connectivity, and structure. Let's start this geography lesson with a history lesson. Back in London in the 1700s, they had a problem. The jails were full and the population exploded. This led to mass poverty, which caused a rise in crime. Many people were quite poor, so they would steal in order to sustain themselves and that theft would cause them to go to jail, and the cycle would continue. The more people, the more poverty, the more poverty, the more desperation, the more desperation, the more crime, the more crime, the more packed the jails. So the jails were full. So they had a solution. They could send their criminals to British colonies in Africa and America. The problem was, America declared independence from Britain on the 4th of July, 1776, Independence Day. So that cancelled out America. So they set up a new penal colony in New South Wales, and that was the solution they went with. So the question is, what is a penal colony? This picture here is from Batman Arkham Asylum. It shows Batman staring at plans for Arkham City. Arkham City was a section of Gotham City that was walled off and all of the criminals were placed inside there. This area became a penal colony. One section was reserved for the criminals and everybody else lived in the city. So anytime you have a penal colony, it's an area where the criminals are simply just shipped there. And that was a solution back in London in the 1700s, set up a penal colony in New South Wales. So, Captain Arthur Phillip, the Royal Navy officer and first governor of New South Wales, he was the man for the job. On the 13th of May, 1787, he got on a boat and he said, let's set sail for Botany Bay. On the 18th to the 20th of January, 1788, he arrived at Botany Bay. But when he arrived, he noticed something. There was no fresh water and there was no fertile soil. So he said, I'll sail north and find a better place. So he arrived at Port Jackson a few days later on the 26th of January, 1788. Once he arrived, he found that there was fresh water and fertile soil and agreed, this is a good place for a penal colony. So he erected the Union Jack and that became the first Australia Day. These settlements grew into large cities. Port Jackson eventually became Sydney Cove, and Sydney Cove eventually became Sydney. And as the generations passed, what they noticed was is that these cities grew denser and more inland. This diagram shows how from 1917 to the projected 2031, we'll notice this trend to continue. The density and people start to arrive in the area, they start to populate, more inland and in much denser quantities. So they become more denser and more inland. This growth of cities is referred to as urbanization. But the question we have now is why did Captain Arthur Phillip move to Port Jackson? Well, the growing population causes poverty by putting too much stress on available resources. If you have a problem where your population is going out of hand and you said, I'm going to set up a new colony, but then you arrive and there's not enough resources and you know this is a huge population, you're going to realize that there's going to be a problem. The resources available are not enough for your population. It's going to cause a lot of problems. So the solution was to urbanize a new land to accommodate growing population but the new land must have viable resources to sustain a growing population. So to recap, in London they realized there is not enough resources for all these people, population is getting out of hand, poverty is exploding, people are committing a lot of crimes. 
the resources cannot manage. So let's find another place, urbanize that area, so there's less pressure on our resources. The decision to move based on advances and disadvantages is what makes up urbanization. Captain Arthur Phillip had to decide here are the reasons for, here are the reasons against, so he could make his decision. And that is the bread and butter of urbanization. The dictionary definition of urbanization is the process of the formation and growth of cities. It's also the change in a country or region when its population migrates from rural to urban areas. The other definition is the proportion of a region's population that live in towns and cities, the rate at which this proportion is growing. Here is a visual example where these images were taken from Google Earth, and they show urbanization happening in a set of two years. So every time the picture changes, only two years have progressed. So here we can see this would be considered more rural. A lot of farmland, a lot of bushland. But look what happens in just two years. Already we can see that there's been a lot more houses and this is attracting more people. As more people move here, it will become more incentivized for other people to move there. They'll start to realize that this is the new hot place to be, so they'll start to migrate. Let's add another two years. While the growth of houses in this picture is not as dramatic as the last two, you can still see that it's beginning to grow. We're also be noticing in the very center that they start thinking about building schools. They start to facilitate and provide facilities to these areas. Keep your eyes on the top right where that area is going to be where the new train line is. Let's add two more years. Another drastic change, we can see that the houses have increased, roads are starting to be more laid out, we have small shops start to pop up, and we can see that as the population grows, the facilities and infrastructure required for these people slowly start to show up. Let's add two more years. Here we can see a slight difference. We can see a bit more houses, the area is slightly starting to get developed, the roads are being constructed better, and you can keep your eye also on the top right because every time we see the picture, we'll see that we get closer and closer to the new train line. But let's add two more years. In this one, we can really see the train line, but in the center, we can see the beginning of the new school. Now that school is being made because all these new people moving here, many of them families with children, and they need to accommodate that need. If they just stop at one school, you're going to find that these families are going to be putting a lot of pressure on that one school. So now they have to build another school. But it's taking a long time. In the span of two years, between 2002 and 2004, most of these houses were just sprung up, completely finished. It took so far 10 years for them to consider start making a second school. But let's keep adding two more years. Here the school we can see is slowly starting to get there. The houses are starting to settle, the parks are nice and made, the train line is there. They're slowly going to start adding a freeway but that hasn't come yet but it will. And let's add two more years. Now we've reached the point where the schools have been completed. In these photos, we can see that both the high schools in the center are completely finished. We can also see that the shops nearby are basically done as well. We are looking bottom and slightly to the right. And there you can see that section of shops. So we've got a Farmer Jacks, there's a McDonald's there. It's basically ready to go and developed. The highways and the trains are done, the houses are completed, and we are slowly getting to the very end, which is the next picture, which is next two years. And now this place has been urbanized. It has schools, it has shops, it has petrol stations, there's trains nearby. This whole place has now been completely urbanized. The pressure went from being really immense on not only just congestion and other existing resources, but now they've built those facilities so these areas can now function independently. 
So they have two schools instead of one school. They have more roads, there's more bus lanes, they have a train station nearby, they've got shops nearby, there's more uh, factories there, there's more businesses, and this has relieved a lot of that pressure. This is a time lapse of what we just saw, so we can see it quickly now. Very impressive. Now here are some more dramatic examples. We can see in Sydney in Australia in 1930, it looked like this. But by 2014, it looked like this. So very much urbanized. It started to attract a lot of people, basically because everyone said, you know, there's a lot of advantages if we move to Sydney. So that attracted the population. And the result was, is that more people arrived there. So they had to build more houses. They had to build more hospitals, more schools, more transportation options. And all of this caused the area to become ur more urbanized. This is Shanghai, China in 1990. Let's just fast forward a couple of years. But by 2014, it's unrecognizable. The city has become modern, high tech, and you can tell this place attracts a lot of people for work, for leisure, for tourism. It's the place to be. This would have attracted a lot of people to go from more rural to urban. Let's go to Shanghai. That's where the opportunity is. Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia in 1990 looked like this. By 2014, it looked like this. Having that growth in population, pressure on resources forced the government to plan ahead. So they built more houses, they built more factories, more schools, more hospitals, until the area became very modern and urbanized. Again, very impressive changes here. Now I have a question. A what is a city with a population of over 10 million? Going to give you just three seconds to think about it. The answer? A mega city. So, a mega city is a city with a population of over 10 million. So, when areas become really urbanized, they will become mega cities. They'll attract enough people that they'll reach the 10 million mark. Most of the world's mega cities in both the developed and developing world are located on the coast, and many of them are growing very rapidly. It is estimated that about one quarter of the entire world's population lives within 100 kilometers of the coast. Now, how does this urbanization influence the movement of people? If we understand urbanization as the shift from rural to urban, and rural being essentially the country life, the agriculture life, and urban being the more city life, then we have to discuss how exactly do people make the mindset, make the choice to go from a rural area to an urban area. So why do people move to where they move to? What's the equation that goes on in their head that makes them decide, I'm going to leave this area that I've grown up in and move to a different area? Well, it's actually quite easy. What we're going to look at is the pull and push factors. This is the equation. It's just two parts. The pull is the good reasons, and the push is the bad reasons. Now, if you're wondering how to remember the difference, it's actually quite easy. There's a lot of reasons why somebody would want to move. If the movement is trash, then we would say it is a push factor. So let's go through some examples. An area with good infrastructure and order in the streets. Is that a pull, a good reason, or a push, a bad reason? It'd be pull, wouldn't it? It's a very good thing. Crime in the streets, a lot of vandalism, riots. In this situation, we would say that's a trash thing to have in a city. So trash, it must be a push factor. So this is a push factor. Weather hazards, things like tornadoes, flooding, that's a trash thing to live with. So, because it's trash, it's a push factor. 
law and order. Everybody likes that, so we would call that a pool factor. Poor infrastructure, stressed resources, that's nothing you want, so that'd be a push factor. Wars, these are civil wars, wars for reasons between governments, between countries. This isn't a nice thing, it's a trash thing to live with, so we would call this a push factor. Good healthcare, good medical facilities, this is a very good thing, so we would call this a pull factor. If you have an area that is very poor, for any schooling and education that's not well maintained, that's not a good thing, so that would be a push factor. Diplomacy and good social relations, we would call this a pull factor. Last one, good climate. This is a pool factor because it's a very good thing. Everyone wants to go to a place where they have good climate, good weather. It's not going to be too wet. It's not going to be too hot. Just right, so that'd be a pool factor. Now, these push and pull factors are largely the main reason why somebody would want to move from one area to another. Suppose you wanted to be an engineer, a teacher, work in law enforcement, IT, be a singer or an actor, a chef, cleaner, builder, or even work in retail. What would the pool, what would the appeal be? The picture on the left, more rural, or the picture on the right, more urban? Well, naturally, you'd have much higher chance of finding a job in these industries on the right. So your push factor for the rural is there isn't much engineering job, there isn't much teaching jobs, there's not much need for that much law enforcement or IT in a rural area. So that is pushing you away. The city, on the other hand, has a very high demand for that. So it's pulling you towards it. So the push factors are pushing you away from the rural and the pull factors are pulling you towards the urban. Another factor is social life. A lot of people like to have some kind of life outside of work. So a social life, things like nightclubs, certain innovations. So for example, you can have a certain bar that's in London, for example, where it's in pitch black and the waiters are all blind. That's an unusual and very exciting new innovation in terms of social life. People want to go and see what's fun. They want to see the new. You won't get that very often, at least, in rural areas. So you'd want to go there for the urban areas. Certain luxuries, you can only really get them in an urban area. Cinemas, there might be one or there might be one in a rural area, but there's probably a lot of them in a urban area. More restaurants, more shops. So you're being pulled towards an urban area because it has more opportunity, more resources. And this is how the push and pull factors work in order to determine where people move to where they move to. Now a main motivator is jobs. People will follow wherever the job is. If you want to be a scientist or a policeman or an engineer or a teacher, you'll go where the work is. If you wanted to be an actor, you're probably going to end up in America. So you will go to where the jobs are. The first video that I uploaded on this channel was a welcome to the channel. And I described that I went from Australia to New Zealand to England. And the idea was to go to Dubai, but COVID happened. And that was because of the job. So I moved because of the job. Those were my pull factors. There's a good geography job in New Zealand so that pulled me towards there. There's a good one in Essex. I went to move there. So my jobs are the major motivator for why people move to where they move to. Now let's look at some key terminology. Starting with dereliction. So this is when old factory buildings and warehouses become disused and abandoned. This is mostly in the inner city and happens when the ports stop being used. So these, once upon a time, were bustling, were very busy, but when the global shift happened and a lot of these industries got shipped overseas, there was no use for these buildings. So what happened is they just got left. They became abandoned, they started to get rust, they were overtook by gangs and homeless, and they become what's called derelict. So if you see a building, you can use the geographic terminology and say that building is derelict.
Urban sprawl is another very useful definition. This is when the urban area gradually moves into more rural areas on the outskirts of the original city. Now we're going to see an example of this later, but the idea is, is that as the city begins to grow, they'll slowly start to expand and expand their parameter until they reach a point where they keep going into more rural areas. So if you were to imagine a couple of hundred years from now, and there are two neighboring cities with a bit of distance between them, it only stands to reason that as they start to expand and develop and the population starts to go and more people have children and there's high demand for housing and for schools, that they'll essentially spread to the point they might even touch each other and become just one big city. So urban sprawl is when the urban area gradually moves into more rural areas on the outskirts of the original city. A greenfield site is an area of agricultural or recreational land that is considered for urban development. So here we can see a picture of some land with a red line around it. The plan is they're going to use that property to build facilities and infrastructure. That is a greenfield site. It's green and they're going to build on top of it. On the flip side, a brownfield site is an area that had previously used in the urban area but has become derelict or disused. However, this area could be rejuvenated and used for future urban development. So if you have a building which has become derelict, why not renew it? Why not use it for something else? You'll see a lot of pictures of people who say, I live in a building that used to be a bank. I, used to, I, I live in a place that used to be a school. There are pictures out there where you find people who live in apartments that used to be schools, and it's clearly a school, but they've just reused it. So this is an area that had previous use that has become derelict or disused. So maybe it's an area that was known for manufacturing, but when all the manufacturing jobs went overseas, all the families left, the schools had no students to teach, so they closed the schools down, and then eventually they rejuvenated the area and turned those schools into like hotel apartment blocks, maybe even restaurants. Now, when planning and managing the future growth of cities, governments and local councils often rely on the following three strategies, suburbanization, urban renewal, and decentralization. Let's go through each of these. Starting with suburbanization, this is the process of growing cities outwards by building new homes more inland and away from the central business district. Here we can see there is a city and imagine the population continuing to grow in that city. Instead of continuing to accommodate and building new apartment blocks and trying to cram the population in there, we can see this unused farmland just over there. Why not get a bulldozer, flatten it out, build your houses there, and then eventually as you build the facilities for those new houses, so these houses obviously need their own hospitals, they need some factories, they need transportation, so train lines, they need shops, they need technology, they need internet there, phone cables, areas to accommodate kids. And by providing those, you urbanize a whole new area, you create a suburb. So instead of focusing on one area, just focus on the area next door. This is a nice analogy where we can see that imagine there was a plate Instead of piling all of your food onto one big plate, suburbanization will be saying, well, it's illogical and it's not sustainable to put it all in one plate. Let's use that spare plate over there and let's move the food to that section. Now you've applied less pressure on your plate and you've provided a comfortable, more manageable and sustainable solution for all essentially. So this is an example of suburbanization. You promote growth in the suburbs just on the outskirts of the city. You push that, they push that pressure away. The next thing is urban sprawl. So this is the spread of the city onto existing farmland or wilderness. So in the previous example, we saw how we leveled some vegetation in order to provide those houses. Urban sprawl is the animals that flee, the habitats you destroy, the, the farmland, the wilderness, the, the trees that were there, everything that was natural that is gone now, we call that urban sprawl. But taking this example, it's as if that other plate was home to a kitten, or a litter of kittens, sorry, in their cardboard box. Now you would have to get rid of the kittens first, and then once they're out of the way, then you can suburbanize. 
and that's urban sprawl when it impacts on the natural side. Now the impacts of suburbanization, they have advantages and disadvantages. The advantages are they can build the homes quickly and pretty cheap, and they can be desired with the newest features. They can have like, you know, double pane glass and solar panels, as opposed to the older houses that might not be up to code then. In this example, we can see what two years looks like. So look how many houses are here. They mainly focus on the top left. This is 2002. Look at 2004. This is a major advantage. So we can suburbanize, and we know that in a matter of two years, we can provide a lot of homes for these people. So that is an advantage of suburbanization. One of the disadvantages is that building the services needed to urbanize these areas is both expensive and slow. Also, because these areas are isolated, these new homes will have to depend on their cars to drive to existing services, causing traffic and congestion. Let's see what that means in just a second. You can see that in 2002, there's not much houses. Two years later, there's a ton of houses, but there's no schools, there's no shops, there's no petrol stations, there's no doctors, there's no train lines, there's no McDonald's, there's none of that. So if these people want to go to school, if they want to get, you know, some hardware, they want to get some plywood or some like an electric drill or maybe some groceries, they're going to have to put extra pressure on existing resources. So they're going to be all in their cars and they're all going to be adding to that congestion. Because look how long it takes for the resources to urbanize these areas takes to get here. So a disadvantage is while it's quick to build homes, it's not quick to build the schools, the shops, and the other infrastructure and resources. Roads, schools, the shops, parks, and the train line take a long time to get there. And that is a disadvantage of urbanization, suburbanization, sorry. Now, if you take the example of the UK, as the population in the UK grows, there'll be a similar pressure on things like the UK's resources. So here we can see it's quite manageable, but as you add that population growth to keep going further and further, it puts a lot of pressure on those resources. And now it's up to governments to plan ahead and figure out how we're going to manage this, how we're going to make sure that the positives of this growth that there's going to be more workers, that the economy is going to boost, does not get outweighed by the pressure. And that's what urbanization has to deal with, the good and the bad. Another strategy is urban renewal. This one is when redeveloping existing areas to accommodate a growing population. So suppose there was a dock. And this dock, once upon a time, was used, but then it became closed. Instead of just leaving it there to derelict, what you could do is re-envision it as something totally different. A tourism center celebrating the history of the place. Come see the historic dockland, for instance. So urban renewal allows townhouses, apartment blocks and offices to be built in existing urban areas without needing to build new ones. So now the disadvantage of suburbanization, that it takes a long time to build the schools, is solved. Just use the existing buildings and just spend a little bit of time to renovate them into the school, into the shops, into the McDonald's, into all that stuff you need. So urban renewal is good in that sense. So the advantage is that it helps the city cope with population growth without the need for urban sprawl because they've already been built. There's no need to destroy the habitat. There's no need to destroy ecosystems because the infrastructure is already there. Another advantage is that many infrastructure already exists, so you don't need to buy a new one. There's already transport links. You don't have to buy, you have to worry about you know, building new train lines or bus routes, and you don't have to think about how we're going to get the phone lines here. It's already there. So it saves you a lot of time and a lot of money. 
One example is in the game Batman Arkham Asylum. This is the second time we've mentioned this. But in this one, they needed somewhere to treat patients that were criminally insane. Instead of building a whole new facility, what they did was is they took an abandoned mansion, which is on this big island called Arkham Island, and they turned it into the facility. So this used to be some rich man's home once upon a time. But now they've renovated the existing areas and turned them into prisoner screening. Security checkpoints. Medical facilities. And even the house has become this major office. So this is an example of urban renewal. They didn't bother building a new one because now they're going to have to get the plumbing work. Now they're going to have the electricity. Now they need to get all these new facilities. It's already there. Just spend a little bit of time, a little bit of money and restore it. And that is urban renewal. Now let's look at the disadvantages. It's expensive. If you were to imagine a factory that was designed to make cars once upon a time, and your plan was, we need a school, and instead of causing urban sprawl, we're just going to renovate this car factory into a school. The task of demolishing certain areas and constructing certain areas to make it a functioning school is going to be very, very expensive. So the drawback, the first one, is it's quite expensive. The second one is if you redevelop the areas that already exist, so that old car factory, it's going to add pressure to the surrounding existing areas. So you're going to have things, problems like transport's going to be crowded and congested. This is the same negative as found in suburbanization. Because now a lot of people are saying, okay, well, this place is being built. I still need to be in this area. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have to use my car. I'm going to have to travel and I'm going to be adding to congestion. So urban renewal's disadvantages is expensive and it adds pressure on existing areas. The next one is decentralization. This is encouraging populations growth and job creation in areas outside the CBD of major cities. So instead of having a focus on the city, you have a big factory or a big business in the city, instead of keeping to focus, the jobs are here in the city, you come to the city, that's where the jobs are, trying to push the focus away to somewhere else. This is decentralization. Now the ways that decentralization is encouraged we can see two examples, regional and suburbs. Regional, they have benefits given to industries and companies to move their operations to smaller regional cities and towns. And the way they do this is they'll offer certain incentives. So for example, suppose you lived in a city and your job was in the city and your boss comes up and says, if you move to a regional location, you'll be eligible for the decentralization tax incentive. So you'll be like, okay, I could move, and you know reap the benefits of this tax cut but at the same time do i want to because you know this is the city there's more opportunity here and you'd have to think about your push and pull factors but they would have to provide you with the pull factors to move to the regional areas and they do that by giving you certain incentives they say there's a benefit if you move here and if they're successful they will take the pressure of your work or your responsibilities and take it off the city and that creates much less pressure Suburbs, what they'll do is they'll spread the location of multiple business activity centers across the city so the business is not all centralized, meaning workers won't all drive to one central location. So for example, you might hear something like our head office is in the CBD, but our research and development department is located west and our HR department is in north. So instead of having it all in one major area where everybody goes to that one area and they're all in one building, by spreading it out, you dissipate some of that pressure. This is how decentralization is illustrated. On the left, when everything is centralized, there's one major location and everything stems from it. Decentralization splits that major focus into smaller sections with smaller splits. And that will result in less pressure on the city. The advantage is that it helps relieve some of the problems of large cities, such as the cost of housing and traffic congestion, because now they've moved, you've just convinced them to move elsewhere.
The disadvantage is it's difficult and expensive to persuade companies and workers to move to regional centers. It's difficult because push and pull factors. Why would I go to an area with less opportunity, with less fun, with less like of a nightlife, with less, you know, restaurants, shops, and move to that place and leave the city where I have all this wonderful luxuries around me? It's expensive because to convince somebody to move, you would need to first convince them with like, hey, I'll give you this much money. I'll make you, do, I'll let you do that. I'll let you do this. And by giving them all these uh, like incentives, that's actually quite expensive. So it's difficult to convince people because pushing pull factors, it makes more sense to move in the city. And it's expensive because it's going to take a lot for somebody to overlook all of those pull factors for the city purely based on how good your incentive is. Let's go through a quiz. This is a picture of what? I'm going to give you in each one of these five seconds. The answer? This is suburbanization, promoting growth just outside the city. The answer? Urban renewal. The answer? Decentralization. So far we've looked at urbanization, push and pull factors, suburbanization, urban renewal, decentralization, all as a concept of how an increase in population can have immense pressure on a city's area to manage in terms of resources and even pollution. So what we're going to do now is see how can regions be classified because they can be either developing, emerging or developed nations. And the first question we have is, what's the difference? Here we can see an image showing a child, a toddler, a teenager, and an adult. We can describe the baby as developing. He's struggling and still needs help from those more developed in order to function. This is essentially the same thing with a nation. If the nation is struggling and requires assistance in terms of trade and financial aid from more developed countries, that becomes a developing nation. The next two are emerging. These are growing very quickly and becoming more significant around the world. So countries like China, you could say, is an emerging country. It's growing very, very fast and it's becoming more significant. It's able to have more responsibilities, it's able to really kind of hold up and it's beginning to show itself as a contender. The adult is developed, mature and sophisticated, capable of sustaining and managing their own finances and difficult decisions. So this is a country which is very sophisticated. This will be post-industrial, which we'll cover in a future lesson. And we can see how developing is quite poor, emerging is getting there, and developed is there. And this is basically the same. We can reflect these onto nations. If nations have these same characteristics, we can understand them as being emerging, developing, or developed nations. But what would happen if a developing country urbanizes too quickly? So you might think, well, if we just hurry up and get these developing countries to urbanize, then they cannot have these problems. Well, what would happen? In developing nations, rapid urbanization happening faster than governments can plan and prepare for puts pressure on urban infrastructure. Things like housing, schools and other services, like the medical facility, the roads, they just can't handle just this sudden surge in population because they aren't able to catch up to that development. This is a surreal image depicting immense pressure on one small area. Now, that kingdom cannot keep up, so that would be the problem of an area developing too quickly. Developing nations, when they urbanize too quickly, result in slums and shanty towns. These grow in many of the huge cities in the developing world. We can see examples in Cape Town, Nairobi, and Mumbai. Sometimes they have no access to housing, fresh water, or sanitation. In the picture on the left, in the background, you can see this very healthy city. But in the foreground, 
those are the people that couldn't be accompanied for, couldn't be accounted for. Those people cannot be accommodated. So they end up making these makeshift houses, which you can see a bit clearer on the right. So this is a consequence of urbanizing far too quickly. The government can't keep up. So they end up having to be forgotten, essentially, and they create these shanty towns. Estimates show that roughly half of the world live in urban cities. By the year 2050, that number is thought to reach 66%, so two thirds. That means that rapid urbanization is only going to continue. It's a sign of the development of the economy in most countries, and the economy is booming in most countries, so we know this problem is coming. Now it's up to governments. They need to manage urban growth to make sure that the positives outweigh the negatives. One such negative is environmental, the enhanced greenhouse effect, or commonly known as climate change. First, let's just get a brief look at what exactly is the greenhouse effect. So the sun shoots energy at the earth in the form of shortwave radiation. We take some of it, but if we take all of it, we'll burn to death. So we let some of it out re-radiated back into the atmosphere in terms of long wave radiation, but we keep some of it. So the earth shoots shortwave, we take some, and then we radiate some back into space in the form of long wave, and it's a very healthy balance. The problem is that the population is growing and they have demands. So as we start to meet their demands, we need more consoles, more cars, more houses, more technology, more food, more all this stuff. It produces a lot of greenhouse gases. Now notice the atmosphere will begin to thicken. As it begins to thicken, you'll notice that there's less radiation being re-radiated back out into space because these greenhouse gases are preventing it from leaving. It's sort of like putting a slight lid on top. Now, if it can't leave, it stays. And if it stays, it keeps us warm. And that is the enhanced greenhouse effect. So greenhouse effect is totally fine. Enhanced greenhouse effect, that's what we have to sort of start preparing for. This graph shows annual temperatures and you'll notice the spike in temperatures goes up around the time we started mass producing. So in the early 1900s, around World War I, we started making tanks like mad, we started making cars, infrastructure, weapons. That made a huge impact. We were producing a lot of this uh, carbon because we were producing a lot of things and that caused the enhanced greenhouse effect. So every time somebody drives a car, that contributes by adding some of that greenhouse effect. Now, one car isn't gonna do much, but there's a lot of cars out there. And every time somebody drives some, it's going to add a little bit more and collectively it can make a big difference. But the UK has an idea. They think all these cars are adding congestion and greenhouse gases. This hurts our ecosystem. So let's provide more sustainable transport options. Because we, we can't say don't leave, but we can say, Here's a better alternative. We're going to be looking at two, congestion tax and park and ride schemes. Congestion charging. This is when motorists pay to travel in parts of large urban areas during the busiest travel times. The aim of the scheme is to reduce the number of vehicles entering the city as possible so that they can use public transport rather than bring their cars in. The money raised can be used to develop sustainable transport in the city, things like cycle routes so to promote people using bicycles instead of cars. An example of this is in London, and it was introduced in 2003. Now the reason is the polluted city. 9,500 people die each year due to air pollution. So if you can say it's a bit more expensive now, there's a, there's a big push factor in taking your car that you now you have to pay a congestion tax that will suddenly create a pull factor for taking your bike, wouldn't it? You wouldn't have to pay for it. So the benefits is that traffic levels reduced by 10.2%. So here we can see it's working. 65,000 fewer car journeys a day, increase in bus journeys entering the zone each day, a 12% increase in cycle journeys, 
and a 12% reduction in emissions. So we can see there's a direct correlation there. So as you create those pool factors, people are going to just naturally think in those two terms. But the issue is that people try to avoid charge by using other routes. So they will try to figure a way to still use their car. And that does mean that a lot of people are still dying. So the reason being that 9,500 people die each year due to air pollution, it has gone down by around 100, but it's still 9,400. So there's still issues with it. But the idea is sound that it has some results. Next is a park and ride scheme. This is when motorists park their cars in large parking areas on the edge of busy cities and catch a bus into town. The parking is free, but often people have to pay for the bus fare. They will locate the schemes on the map routes into the city centre so easily accessible for people. This means less vehicles travelling into the centre, which reduction, congestion and pollution. So here we can see examples. Now these are colour coordinated. You can, for instance, ride your bike to the bus station, lock it in one of these lockers, the coloured ones, and then you can simply just go on the same colour bus as the locker and you know you're in that same circle loop. Australia has one called the Cats. There's the Blue Cat and the Red Cat. These are free buses, absolutely free. And it's a nice way and it promotes people not using these infrastructures. And this is a similar one. If you knew that there is a area with free parking, but you know that if I don't take this free parking that I know for sure is here, I'm going to have a hard time finding parking later. Odds are you're going to take the free parking, go on the bus and problem solved. And this tries to promote people to use less cars on the road. This example specifically is in Cambridge. Now, now that we know that the ins and outs of urbanization, let's learn how to categorize a city. And we're going to do that by looking at site, situation, emerging country, connectivity and structure. When we say site, site is land that a settlement is built on. So here we can see a settlement and it's built on some land. That's it. That's the site, whatever it's built on. When we go to situation, situation is where the settlement is compared to the physical and human features around it. So relative to wherever the settlement is, if, for example, you had mountains and a cathedral, you would say the situation of this settlement is that you have mountains to the southwest of the settlement and a cathedral to the east. So you imagine you're in the center of the settlement and that's what's in relation to you. That's your situation. This can be things like there is a river that carves from this direction to that direction. Anything in that sense is called situation. Emerging country is also known as places where there is high and medium development. So it's not blanketed, but there are areas that are doing really well and areas that are not doing that well. So here we can see medium development and high development in the same area. Result is that is an emerging country. Connectivity is the way that the city is connected or linked to other settlements in the country as well as other countries in the world. If there is a settlement nearby and you have a train link between them, that's connectivity. If they both have airports that connect them to each other and to countries outside the world, that's also connectivity. Finally, city structure is the arrangement of land use in urban areas. In other words, how the land use of a city is set out. So if an area is doing really, really well, they'll probably have a very big central business district, they'll have good inner cities, and they'll have nice areas where they'll have housing, but there'll always be the problem of shanty town settlements and squatter areas where there are poor people, they don't have, they're not being accommodated by the government, so they end up finding these makeshift homes. So we can see section of the city divided into CBD, suburbs, inner city, urban rural fringe. 
So for CBD, these are things like businesses, residential, retail, and entertainment. Anything in those sectors would be part of the CBD. Suburbs is residential and commercial. Inner city is residential and industry. Urban rural fringe is residential. Now let's see what that looks like. Here we have four pictures. I'm gonna give you 15 seconds to look at these and decide which one goes with which. If you think A goes with one, you would just simply think A1. If you think C goes with one, you'd say 1C. I'm gonna give you 15 seconds starting now. Three, two, one. Where the businesses are is CBD. The inner city originally is was made to make sure that you've got, if there's a factory in the center, we need to house the workers. So let's make the inner city. So the inner city is largely where the industry is. Suburbs is probably where you would live, I imagine, if you're more like, you know, suburban. That's more like a residential, commercial. So where your shops are, this area has a new shop. McDonald's are pretty much all around there. And urban rural fringe is simply just the residential that's been suburbanized. Now, today in this lesson, we have looked at quite a few things. We've seen what urbanization is. We know what suburbanization is. We've looked at green and brownfield sites, push and pull factors. We've seen how population increases can have a lot of different impacts. We can now tell the difference between a developing, emerging, and a developed country. We've seen the consequences of rapid urbanization. We've seen how places in the UK have tried to make sustainable cities by promoting more sustainable transport. We've seen the impact of urbanization and that growth on climate change and now we can characterize an area based on its site situation and connectivity and structure thank you for watching this video please support the channel by clicking subscribe